Good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to welcome you all to the first of five webinars this year in our series, Our Daughters, Our Future, an educational series exploring girls' mental health and wellness. At Gateways, we're continuing to work to raise awareness to reduce the stigma around mental illness. And our goal is to give all of us the knowledge and strategies to support our young people. We are so grateful to the Miriam Fund of Boston Jewish Boston's Combined Jewish Philanthropies for sponsoring our series. The Miriam Fund is committed to creating a world that expands opportunities for women and girls, and we are thrilled that they have funded us for the series again this year. The agenda for this evening is to hear first from Emily, who will share her moving story, followed by our speaker, Dr. Betsy Stone. We encourage you to use the chat function to the panelists and attendees to ask questions and offer your thoughts as the speakers talk. And then after Dr. Stone is finished speaking, Dr. Rachel Schein will pose the questions that you've asked throughout the presentation. Before I turn over the program to Rachel to introduce our speakers, I wanna remind you that you will receive resources and a survey following this event. We are always eager to hear about the additional topics that you might be interested in hearing about. So Rachel, I will turn it over to you. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Rachel Shine, and I am thrilled um, to be back with Gateways this year, um, coordinating uh, this wonderful webinar series focused on um, girls' mental health. Um, and I am thrilled to introduce um, first Emily Wong, um, who is coming to us all the way from Napa Valley, California. So it's a bit earlier and probably a little bit warmer there than it is here in the Northeast. Um, but Emily is a 12th grader at American Canyon High School, um, and she um, is with us through an organization called um, This Is My Brave. Um, and then our um, speaker is, or, um, is Dr. Betsy Stone, um, and Dr. Stone is a retired clinical psychologist, a Yale educated, who um, is between Connecticut and New York and has really spent, I think the last 10 years um, teaching and speaking at um, many synagogues and at Hebrew Union College um, with educators and parents and rabbis. Um, and she has become um, somewhat of an expert, if any of us can be an expert in, in um, life post COVID, uh, but really has spent a lot of time um, working with working with those who work with adolescents to help um, understand adolescents. Um, and so uh, first we would love to hear from Emily. Um, yeah. All right, so I'm just, I wrote a little introduction about myself too, Rachel, so I'm just gonna share that. <laughs> so as I said, my name is Emily Long. I'm 17 and I'm living in a small town in the Northern California Bay Area. I go to school at a school called American Canyon High School and I'm on track to graduate in June. I was officially diagnosed with depression in September of my freshman year after I was admitted to a local psychi psychiatric hospital. Around a year later, my mom showed me a call for young adults to uh, speak at a show called This Is My Brave. I had just written a poem about being in a year of recovery since my hospitalization, so I had the perfect mat material to audition with. I originally skipped my first audition, surprisingly enough, but I pushed through and I scheduled a second and I pursued about a month of rehearsals, um, practicing my speech and becoming acquainted with the other young adults. And then um, being able to share my most vulnerable parts of myself has been one of the most empowering things in my life. Um, from that first time sharing, I knew that I was gonna grow. And from there, I would just like be able to help others through their own hard times as well. And so I just recently finished uh, submitting college applications and I plan on studying psychology or sociology to better help others struggling and ultimately learn more about myself. And so now I have a poem and um, it's called Finding. And so here we go. <laughs> Separation, deprivation, losing ourselves as a nation, split between left and right, a bond dissolved, not as tight. Global turmoil, an attitude of spoil. Loneliness at home, something people refuse to show. A time of uneasy, learning life isn't breezy. A time of sad, turning out not to be so bad. Teenagers growing into themselves, putting their past on the shelves. 
not under the eyes of our peers, we lessen our fears. Able to dig deep, not feeling the need to follow like a sheep. No trends to conform to, I have felt it too. Growing into your body, finding a new hobby. Becoming the you that you love, happy at the thought of. Being comfortable in your skin, allowing yourself within to flourish in the light that may never have felt quite right. A time of despair leading to repair of the inner self put on the shelf. When led to conform, no longer left torn between the identity within, it begins to win. Letting your inner inward self shine, something that's been lost since age nine. A freedom regained despite all the pain. The surrounding loss never leaving our thoughts. A burden we will carry to our Emily, we've lost your, your volume altogether. Um, a burden you will carry and then you disappeared. Can you try again, hon? Emily, can you hear me? All right, yeah. I, okay. you're, we're frozen. We're good now. Okay. Oh, Emily warned us that her computer would do this. <laughs> so you got to a burden we will carry. Okay. Back up a little bit. Go back a couple of lines before that, hon. All right. I'm going to go. Okay, a little bit back. <laughs> when led to conform, no longer left torn. Between the identity within, it begins to win. Letting your inward self shine, something that's been lost since age nine. A freedom regained despite all the pain. The surrounding loss never leaving our thoughts. A burden we will carry, to our kids we will tell the story of through the rain, how we regained the feeling of self we once left on a shelf. Lovely, lovely. So you, you got to everything but the last line, didn't you? I did, yeah. <laughs> so I, Emily, I, let's pull that apart if we can a little bit. I mean, I don't have it, it in front of me, so I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna be asking you questions. Um, there were a couple of the themes I heard in the in your poem, and um, one of them is the question of kind of who am I inside and versus outside. Um, another was um, trying to figure out how to deal with pain. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk to us for a little bit about what you had to learn to learn how to manage being in pain sometimes. Um, managing pain has definitely been a big part of my recovery. And I think just recovery in general, um, life is painful. And that's something um, you have to deal with um, just in life, um, whether it's mental health and mental illness or just, um, just like physical pain it, mm -hmm, it's just mm -hmm. that happens and um so learning to cope with that is really important and something that i found that is really helpful a is poetry which is how i get out most of my emotions that i don't feel like i can express or talk about and then the other thing that is really helpful is um swimming i'm a big swimmer and water polo player and so getting the endorphins rushing um it definitely makes me feel better and i can kind of like work through the pain by working out and it's just perfect so you know one of one of the interesting things about the about that idea of working through the pain is that in fact people have to learn skills about managing pain that we don't get to say i can live a life where i'm just happy um yeah. or i can live a life where things go my way but that in fact we need to all learn how to manage being miserable at times. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Um, what did you have to learn to learn how to do that? Oh, and, and you can, and if you want to not answer a question that I ask you, um, put your finger on your nose and I'll ask you a different question. <laughs> You're good. It's a really big question. Um, as I said, I've been struggling with mental illness in my mental frozen it muted again i'm going to give you a second to see if you can get back 
try saying something. You're not frozen. You're just muted. No. All right. All right. Okay, you're back. <laughs> oh my God. All right. So, all right. The trials and tribus, tribu you know, of technology. Yep. Well, and in fact, it, it, it's not, I'm, look, you're going to think I'm, I'm ridiculous, but this is an example of the kinds of things, kinds of skills that we all had to learn how to develop over COVID, that we had to be able to say, oh, she's frozen, she'll come back, um, as opposed to she's frozen, I'll go do something else. Um, the, that in fact, it is in the failures in the complications in the difficult things that we actually develop skills the stuff that is easy to do I don't have to develop skills for like I don't have to develop skills for walking I know how to do that at this point um so um I have to back up and try to remember what my question to you was <laughs> um how did you how did you learn what did you learn about managing pain um well, I'm just gonna start over the whole thing. I don't know what you heard, but um, I've been struggling with mental illness and my mental health, as I said, about freshman year. Um, but I probably started struggling around 13, so roughly around puberty. So I've been learning how to deal and cope uh, with pain since then. Oh, I lost track. What was the question? <laughs> uh, what did you have to learn? How, you know, what skills did you have to learn? How did you have to learn to do this? Yeah, so, um, I had to learn to recognize pain. That was something that I didn't really understand. I didn't understand that what I was feeling was a type of pain. I I didn't understand that it wasn't normal just to, you know, feel sad and sluggish and um, not wanting to get out of bed, not wanting to eat food, not showering, not being able to do my laundry. I had to be able to recognize that. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I was struggling with intrusive thoughts. So thoughts that were not my own um, or what felt like they weren't my own. And so I had to manage and learn how to look at the thoughts and be like, okay, that's something I'm thinking, but doesn't mean I have to take it in and deal with it. I can just let it pass by. Right. And so that's one of my biggest things when um, managing what's going on inside my brain is just, just see it and let it go. And so I think right. that's the the biggest tool that I have learned and I will forever keep telling people like this is something that is just so helpful. Right. That kind of yoga meditative state of it comes in, it goes out, it comes in, it goes out. So I'm assuming that a lot of the people who are listening to us right now are parents or guardians. Um, I wonder how what this was like. Do you have any sense of what it was like for your parents? as you got sadder and sadder oh i do i do definitely have some sense we we did um family therapy for a while before i went to an individual therapist and i've seen it way in my parents um i had some i struggled with pan panic attacks as well as just depression so it'd be very um outward struggle and so um not being able to breathe like it got to a point where I would be hyperventilating and crying so hard that I couldn't feel my extremities. Mm -hmm. So it was very outward. And so over time I could tell it grew my parents and um, I knew, I knew they understand what I was going through. Um, and they were just looking for the best way to help me and that it saddened them as well. Like, like there's only so much they could do to help me. So from what I understand, they felt a little bit helpless. Like all they wanted to do was help, but there was no helping, especially when I was pushing away so much. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, it brought me a lot of shame in my own mental illness. Um, and I wish I could repay them for all they've done, but I just know that doing small things like this, um, presenting and bringing like light to other people is, is like being like, oh, look at, you've done so much and I'm just going to keep doing so much for other people, like passing on that, right. that ability yeah, would, to help. You definitely are paying it, trying, are paying it forward. And that, um, you know, we don't ever get to pay people back for the things they've done for us, but we absolutely can pay things forward. Um, do, when you, um, 
when you were really sad, when you were really depressed, now de it, just as a tangent right now for people listening, um, depression and sadness are really different. It is completely normal for everybody to have times when we're really sad. Um, it's the, the, the depression is a diagnosable disorder where sadness is just part of being human. Um, what, um, what, what is it that you learned in your depression that made it different than sadness? And then um, I know Rachel has a question. What did you learn in your depression that made it, how, how did you know it wasn't just sad? Um, I use a lot of metaphors when it comes to my mental illness. Um, so one way I'd like to describe the difference between, between um, sadness and depression is I started to see the world differently. Like it was like, oh, I'm gonna, my laptop's gonna die. I even brought a charger for this. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> wow, okay, sorry. It's fine, it's fine. This is, this is the joy of technology. <laughs> this is public reintegration. It's all I, about flexibility, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Like, if this has taught us anything, it's that we need to be flexible. Right. <laughs> All right, sadness versus depression. I, I stopped seeing the world in color. Life became muted and it was almost black and white. Mm -hmm. My thinking became black and white, um, co like colors itself, um, feelings became black and white. There was no, there was no happy, it was just happy and sad. There was no happy and you know, like, okay today, there was none of that and um, one of the feelings I know when I'm now identifying when I'm in a depressive st uh, state is my bones get heavy. My body feels heavier than it is. So I feel like I'm like trapped in a, my body. So that's much different than sadness. Um, yes. I felt both. So it's become easier to identify um, where I'm just like, oh, this is not right between like, okay, this is something that I need to work through and I can understand and it's going to be easier to pick apart than a chemical imbalance. So absolutely. Absolutely. And the, you know, in some sense of that sense of heaviness and the and the mutedness of color is a way for you to it, it's like a signal, even if you're not thinking, oh, wait a minute, I am not in good shape. Um, that's a signal that that lets you know, pay attention, pay attention. That's a useful signal for you. Um, Rachel, you had a question. I do. So one of the uh, participants asked, um, were there any things that your therapist, Emily, this is for you, were there any things that your therapist did that helped you engage in therapy and want to learn the skills when you were feeling more depressed? I am lucky to have a wonderful therapist. So she has done a lot of things that have helped me um, really engage and pay attention. So when I'm in a depressed state, it's really easy for me to just kind of like step out and like kind of disassociate or dissociate. Um, so she would make sure that it was a conversation. It was not like she was like, um, it wasn't like she's holding like a seminar. She wasn't speaking at me. She was making sure she was constantly asking questions and bringing it back. And if I did need a moment, moment where things became too big or the topic was really heavy, that she would just be like, okay, take a moment, regroup. Um, and she was very careful that like, I was able to use my coping mechanisms in therapy in session. Like she would give me like some clay or some like slime was really big, especially when I was going through it. Um, so I could like move move like fidget with it because that's really helpful when my body is moving my brain is like easier to move as well and then um in in actual hospitalization it was uh it changed more from talk therapy into um like i did some art-based therapy and i'd have to write things down and i did some journaling and so having something physically to do is like really helpful seeing it on paper was really nice instead of talk but I've learned to like really adjust to talk therapy. So for like people who are struggling just to talk and like keep focused, like paper, like assignments would be helpful. That's great. In fact, what you're, you know, what you're elucidating for us is that 
my brain gets stimulation from lots of things and I don't, it's not just words that matter. Um, and that using my body to make my brain work and using my brain to make my body work, both of those are really useful um, techniques. Um, a, a funny question for you. Go for it. Um, I think that many of us, when we think about mental health, are really thinking about the absence of mental illness. Mm. We're not thinking about health. We're thinking about the absence of illness, right? So when, if I said I want to be physically healthy, I, I would actually, there would actually be aspects of that that weren't just the absence of illness. They would have to do with eating right and, and exercising and interacting with other people and other things that make people physically healthy. Do you feel like at this point, you know enough about your own wellness as opposed to the absence of illness that you can pursue wellness as opposed to run away from illness? It's a weird question. I get, I get what you're saying. Okay. Um, I do think I can pursue my own wellness um, instead of just like running from mental illness and mental health, um, like the dark parts of it, mm -hmm. um, especially with medication, which is something that's really helped me manage my symptoms. I'm able to focus on, you know, positive thoughts and mindfulness. And so something I'm working on right now is mindful eating mm -hmm. um and really taking in nutrition instead of just you know just putting it in my body like enjoying it and slowing down and so with that it's a little bit more of the wellness side than mm -hmm. like the, like the running from it so that's just like one example of like right now but i do think i have done enough work that i'm able to like take care of myself to like an extra extent extent like i've been here and now I can go here. Right, right. So um, I, 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 can I respond directly, Rachel, to this question in the chat box? Okay, so there's a question in the chat box. I don't know if everybody can see them, so I will read the question for you. Um, as parents, does trying to encourage and trying to have your daughter snap out of it um, and trying to convince that life is good and is there no reason to be depressed actually make the depression worse? So here's the answer to that. Um, if I say to you, I'm cold, and you say it's not cold in here, what I hear is I'm not entitled to feel what I feel. Um, and that you are not um, a, it, it, your evaluation of, of the state of the room is more important than my experience of my own body. Um, I think lots of us spend a lot of time trying to talk people out of how they feel. Um, and I think it, get, it is absolutely something that happen, has happened to women at least my entire life, and I'm sure much, much longer, that women describe an emotional experience or a physical experience and are told that their experience is invalid. This is one of the things we know about women in pain, for example, is that when women go to physicians and say, I'm in pain, doctors very often say, no, you're really not, it's not that bad. Um, much more with women than with men. And what I think ends up happening for lots of women, and I'm not speaking about a particular kid versus another particular person, but I think that one of the things that happens is that we begin to doubt our own relationship with ourselves. We begin to doubt our own expertise about ourselves. That if I have to prove to you that it's cold in here for me to be entitled to be cold, I, I'm, I'm weakened. I'm not, an, I'm not an authority on me. Um, and we know that this happens to women more than men. We know it happens to women of color more than it happens to um, Caucasian women. Um, that there is that that we have as a society um, a willingness to tell women and girls that what you feel is actually not what you feel. It's Can not that there's any. Go ahead, go ahead, Emily. Um, uh, I have had people um, say to me that 
you know, depression is just sadness, which is kind of like the question. Um, it is really invalidating, as Betsy has said, but it also, it worsens the thoughts. So when I say I have intrusive thoughts, it, um, it makes me feel like my mental illness and my struggles aren't big enough, again, in validation, but it, it, sometimes it only makes it worse. So maybe rewording um, is helpful, but uh, the invalidation can definitely feel like way heavy on the shoulders sometimes more than mean it to. Right, it makes you feel small. And, and I think that part of the problem is then, it, in fact, if I say to you, I'm really sad today, and you say you have nothing to be sad about, or you're not sad, um, actually, you know, the, the one that we're, women hear that all the time, we also hear, if we say I'm scared, we're told that there's nothing to be afraid of, but I'm already afraid, so I don't really know why you told me that. Um, the problem is then that I now have to prove to you that I'm actually scared. I have to prove to you that I'm actually sad. So that in, now I have to actually be more sad so that you'll believe it. I have to be more scared so that you'll believe it. Um, my guess is that if you tracked the response of a kid, um, if you track the response of a kid to um, the message, you don't have to be sad, that it would actually be that it escalates the sadness. It doesn't diminish it. And if your goal is to diminish it, um, I think what actually makes a much bigger difference is to say, tell me, what's going on? What does it feel like? Um, you can ask the question, what is that sadness? What does that sorrow feel like? What does that impulse feel like in your body? What does it make you think? There's lots of ways to approach it. Um, what, when did it start? But when somebody says to you, I feel X, they're actually asking you to ask them questions, to, to follow up with them. They're not asking you to make it go away. This is, as a parent, um, one of the real issues is that we want to take our kids' pain away, um, but they're entitled to their pain. Em, what do you think about, the, uh, about this, this question of, um, how to respond and there was a follow-up about um about this yeah. in terms of eating disorders as well yeah. so i don't know if it's an eating so disorder or an or disordered eating which are actually different right so go go for it so the follow-up specifically was as a parent of someone who handles pain with binge eating if i say stop eating will it make the cycle worse I have been on both ends of the spectrum. I struggled with restrictive eating and then I have bounced back and now I'm actually in a kind of more of a comfort eating uh, through COVID. And so I am addressing that currently and working on coming back to like a healthy state in my body where it's like comfortable. And so definitely um, I, my mom has been looking out for me before and like, hey, is like that the best choice to be making right now? I have, I have taken that wrong. And um, I'm sure you have. <laughs> <laughs> I have. And I've taken it so wrong to a point where I was like, hey, that's only going to make like my restrictive eating worse. And looking back on it, she, she is right. And I am really incredibly grateful for her for looking out for me and like, being able to look ahead and say, this is something that's going to come back and bite you in the butt is like, that's, I think that's a phrase. And so I, if she was to reword it in a way that would not only be good in the moment, be, but be good in the future, I would probably word it as, um, as like, um, so, looking out for you. Go ahead, go ahead, Betsy. Yeah. So I, I want to point something out to everybody who's watching here, which is that, look, we know that Emily is really self-aware. She's already demonstrated that to us, that she is self-aware that she is paying attention to her responses. And yet, when her mom is doing this thing, which is designed to be benevolent and loving, Emily gets pissed off. It's not that you we get to a point with, particularly with adolescents, but e even with older children, um, with adult children, it's not that we get to a point where we suddenly don't have conflict. 
conflict is inherent in the relationship between parents and children. It's frankly inherent in all intimate relationships. It, there is always conflict in intimate relationships. So the fact that Emily's mom says something and it pisses Emily off does not mean it's wrong. It means it pissed Emily off. Um, and that distinction is really important for us. Um, it's highly unlikely that your mom at that moment could have said anything about what you were eating that wouldn't have pissed you off. And yet, as a mom, she had felt an obligation to say something. Part of what we do as parents is, is that we, we say things and do things that make our children unhappy because that's part of what parenting requires of us. That the goal of parenting is not to satisfy and make your child happy. It's the goal of parenting is to make an adult. It's a totally different goal. Um, and if I'm thinking about making an adult, then I have to ask questions like, is that really what you want? Because I want you to think. If my goal is to make you happy, there should be Twizzlers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That would be the thing for me. <laughs> uh, so true. Um, um, so I, I, I want to respond to, to Jeff's question. There's a question in the chat. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. It's a good okay, one. as a parent of a daughter struggle, do you, why don't you read it, Rachel? I, as a parent of a daughter struggling with depression, how can we help her with her room, her laundry, closed door, eating, exercise, grooming, things like that. Um, I think probably from both of your perspectives, you know, what, you know, Betsy, you know, go ahead, what, what do you think? Um, so you want me to go first, Emily, or do you want to go? I mean, I'll go and then you can, you okay. can follow up because you probably Great. can like clean up my words a little bit, like refine it. <laughs> clean up your words, clean up your room, whatever. <laughs> yep. Um, I was actually just recently in a state where um, I wasn't able to take care of myself as I was like a month ago, like before then. And I mean, still now, I won't, I won't pretend like my room is immaculate. I definitely have laundry bins stacking up in the corner. And, but when it does get to a point where it's unmanageable, it definitely, um, it only makes things worse. And so for the laundry example, which is personally my most pressing, sadly, um like my mom will like do the laundry for me and she will sit down will not sit down but she'll come with me and put the laundry away together because that makes the task more manageable um and what are the other aspects of the question it was um, laundry eating. room exercise eating grooming yeah um eating was one of the ones i, str I struggle with and so like family dinner and I'm really bad about eating breakfast so my mom will like kind of like guide me to create breakfast if not make the breakfast for me especially in a state where i can't do that myself like right now as i struggle with um eating too much and eating too little i'm trying to find that equilibrium and so as i like don't eat breakfast she'll like make my lunch if i make my breakfast so it's really just having that helping hand and that extra little bit of support and just like guiding. If you can do some, they can do some. And that's just personally works what works for me. And I've seen it work for some other people too. Um, and it's just, it's so comforting and it's so meaningful, even if it's not like stop the world for you, it is so, so helpful. Um, so what you're talking about actually is your mom negotiating with you about what's yeah. gonna get done. Um, and part of what she's saying is, um, effectively trust me, I know you need to eat, I know you need to do these things. Um, and some of the time, again, I'm sure you snarl or roll, roll your eyes and other times you're willing to eat whatever it is she has prepared. Um, do let's be aware as we um, continue this conversation that um, we're not living in normal times um, and that the things that we might have seen two years ago and re reacted to in a certain way, we're reacting to in different ways now. Um, you know, all of us, adults and teenagers, are regressed. All of us are more impulsive than we have historic than we would normally be. 
um, all of us are more reactive than we would normally be. Um, and so for our children and for ourselves, there is this sense of kind of being on the cliff uh, a lot of the time. And so let's not use the standard we would have used without COVID to measure ourselves in COVID. Um, in fact, we know, um, we know that there has been a significant increase in anxiety um, amongst adolescents and adults. Um, a, a little tangent of teaching here for a moment. Anxiety and stress are actually very different. Um, we tend to use the words interchangeably. Um, they mean very different things. Um, stress happens in the present and the very near future. I have to study for a test um, and and I say to myself, I have to study for a test. I hate this class. I hate this teacher. I'm just going to do it. Stress ultimately makes, motivates me to act. It's kind of like the accelerator in the car. Anxiety, on the other hand, lives in the present and the very far future. That when I'm anxious, I say to myself, I'm still study, have to study for this test for this teacher I don't like. I say to myself, this teacher hates me. I will get a bad grade in this class. I always get a bad grade in this class. I'm really stupid. I'm not going to be able to go to college. Or if I go to college, it's going to be a terrible school. And I'm going to end up as a mechanic or working at McDonald's. So why study for the damn test? That's anxiety in action. It's in the very far future. It doesn't have a solution in the short run. I mean, it ultimately becomes the brake as opposed to the accelerator. It doesn't get me to move. It gets me stuck. Um, we're seeing an increase in anxiety now in that far future, I'm going to fail. I can't, there's not much point in my doing this. Um, not as much of an increase in stress. So that's really an interesting um, dichotomy. Um, and also, we also know that there were kids who, when we were in lockdown and were not in live school, were actually thriving. Kids who were doing better in virtual schooling than they did in person-to-person in, in -person schooling. Why is that? There probably less bully. There was definitely less bullying. There was less cyberbullying, which I was shocked by, I would have thought cyberbullying was going to go through the roof. It did not. There's much more bullying now than there was in lockdown. Um, both in-person bullying and cyberbullying have jumped up again. Um, there, but there was also not the noise and the changing and the moving from class to class and the social pressures and who do I eat lunch with and all of that stuff was removed when we were in in locked in lockdown education um and so for many of our kids they actually were doing better for much of the last year and are doing worse now because the anxiety ha is now going up the, in in a funny way um I, I remembered working with a bunch of youth professionals and i said to them or the, in probably you know, we went into lockdown in March and probably May, I said to them, I'm at the point now where the kids I used to always be worried about, I'm much less worried about. And the kids I never worried about, I'm much more worried about. That there was a real flip um, in who was really suffering. I think that we are flipping back, except that the level of suffering is much more universal. That more kids are hurting, more of the time um and that it that it it, it demi that we have to pay attention to that we really have to pay attention to that we can't say um post covid i'm not sure what post covid actually means i have been i have been and i know all of you have changed by this experience um and so 
the me in the future is different than the me in the past. Um, one of the interesting um, things we think when we talk about trauma, and I'm going to come back and ask you another question in just a second when I stop babbling for a minute. Um, one of the interesting things we know about trauma is that communal trauma changes the trajectory of history and individual trauma changes the trajectory of lives. So I am changed on both levels both in terms of the, the historical changes. For example, I, I honestly believe that Trump would have been reelected, but for COVID. That's a change in the trajectory of history, but there are also changes in our personal trajectories. Um, whether we got divorced, whether we had children, whether we decided not to have children, whether we, um, fell apart, whether we didn't fall apart, there, there's changes in who I am because of the last 20 months. And those we won't go back from. Those we will integrate into our futures, future personalities, our future, our future lives. Um, but there's no back here. There's the next normal and there's the normal after that. And there's the normal after that. And if I were a betting woman in my kishkas, I think it's going to be you are really still in a state of flux. Emily, what do you think was the impact? I mean, you of COVID for you? Because obviously, you know, your hospitalization was four years ago and, and predates this communal trauma. What, what do you think, what, what was COVID in your process of recovery? All right, I'm just going to double check that I'm not frozen and you can still hear me. I can hear you. You're not moving, but it's okay. I can hear you. <laughs> Okay, can you just restate the question one more time? Because you okay. kind of how did how did the last twenty months change your trajectory? Okay, um, the last twenty months have um, they've they've been positive and negative. Um, for example, one um, one negative, randomly enough, is um, my GPA was freshman year with hospitalization. I didn't have like great grades or anything, but I was on the trajectory up. And then uh -huh. sophomore year, we went to um, second semester, we went to um, uh, pass or no credit. Mm -hmm. And without the actual letter grade, I I didn't have the opportunity to keep going up, even though I was doing so well in my classes before we went to isolation. But like positively, I have I've come into myself more. I've stopped putting standards that I have um, tried to conform to, especially in such a small community, like trends are really tight and they get passed around really quickly. Like everyone's conforming and then all of a sudden, oh, we don't like that anymore. It's time to move on. Um, and so coming back, I've noticed just like in how I dress and how I carry myself and um, what I'm interested in, it's not the same as everybody else. And I no longer have a problem with it because I didn't, I don't feel the need to be a part of that anymore. And that's partially because of COVID, but I also think that comes with age. Um, but I it's think more that- because of COVID. It's really more because of COVID. It, that's something that we tend to do later in life, not at 17, but later in our lives. So give COVID- yeah, I would echo for, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you, you know, what's really interesting about this, um, for, for parents who are on the call, um, the, your parent, the parent generation that's on this call did not grow up in a, in a life with, that was constantly being curated. Um, Emily's life has been curated from the moment she got a smartphone um, and it was, and it has been, con she, it has been a constant theme for our kids that they have to compare 
their insides to the curated outsides of other people. And my insides are never going to come up and be comparable to somebody else's curated outside. There, I'm going to fail at that in that comparison every single time. Um, and we, pardon? That's really important. I'm just, um, how grateful I am for you for saying that. Like, yeah. Yeah, um, and we know that at the that at the time when smartphones really were becoming ubiquitous, that we saw a significant decrease in self esteem and self management, particularly in adolescent girls. Like there was a dramatic shift. Um, if you're interested in this, the person who does the most work on it is a woman named Jean Twenge, T W E N G E, and she has some. She has lots of books, and they're and they're readable. They're not um, they're not abstract and out in the ozone. Um, a, Shahar, a curated life is a life that is presented to the out. Oh well, Emily's done this. Um, you, I, what I show on in social media is the is the successes and the and the and the I'm so hot and I'm so good. Um, the you know the sexy photos, the smart photos, the athletic photos, me with an award, um, but that's only a very small part of who I am. And um, though, I, and I don't, I don't know if I can answer this question from Emily. I'm curious. Do you think people curated less in COVID? Was there was there less of the you know, let me show you how fabulous I am on social media. Um, this is both on Instagram. The, it, Emily's age doesn't use Facebook. Um, your parents do. It's on TikTok. Um, it's also on, um, should I out this? Finsta, which is every kid's fake Instagrams that they let their parents <laughs> see that are not their real Instagrams. But go ahead, Emily, was it, was it as curated? um i think to some extent yes and i think it was especially in the top one percent um but for the most day-to-day -day people that i interact with i follow um my TikTok for you page um i don't think it is i thought it, i i see a lot more uh, we lost you lost you i see a lot more <laughs> Emily, you're worth waiting for, sweetie. <laughs> no, it's not coming. You can't get it up. Okay, here we are. Here we are. Okay. It. Okay, where did you lose me? Um, it, we see a lot more. <laughs> so we're talking about um, who curates and and is there a change in that curated image in in COVID. And I'm just amazed that I'm able to come up with this because I have such bad COVID brain all the time. And I'm <laughs> so Emily, you've got me entranced. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, I think we did see more curation with um, celebrities and the, like the top 1%, um, especially with all the, oh, you know, we're all in this together. Um, I think there was more, cu more curation of, oh, look at I'm sitting at home in my robe with my million dollar dog and we are taking care of ourselves but right. with the day-to-day -day people you and me the people i interact with um like for example on tiktok for you page i would see lots of people just accepting where they are and so for some people that is like documenting what they did on a day-to-day -day basis that was a trend it was like a day in my life it right a little bit of an older trend but it's like i would see people who are just like oh look at me i'm in bed and then they document again two hours later, I'm still in bed. And then it's like, I just didn't have the energy to do something today and that's okay. And it's it's really nice seeing um, truth in how life actually goes, that life isn't all sparkly and perfect all the time. And that's really refreshing. Right. One of the messages that our kids have gotten, and then um, Rachel, we should go to Talia's question if, if that's okay. Um, one of the messages that I think our kids have gotten is that um, their lives are supposed to be good and that we really, they're supposed to make us feel good about what they're living 
by making by presenting themselves as happy um, and it's happy a lot of the time. One of the aspects I think of COVID that's been very interesting to watch is that that um, inauthentic everything's fine um, is something that we have largely given up. up. Um, and I, I, I actually think that's really good for our teenagers um, that they're not having to pretend to be well put together and and really organized and you know president of every club um they get to be who they are in ways that are much more um authentic and authentic for me includes tired and irritable and sad and um hangry and all the things that that are that all of us should be allowed to feel Absolutely. So we do have some questions. Go ahead, Rachel. So um, Talia says, I'm curious for you to speak more about anxiety and social anxiety in particular. So do you have thoughts about what parents, siblings, other family members, teachers, clergy, et cetera, can do to help our youth as they are going back to school and after school programs? So specifically managing anxiety as they are reintegrating. You want to go, Emily? Um, I can't speak much about social anxiety. I do have a friend who struggles a lot with it. I mean, we're attached to the hip. So I definitely, I see her um, struggling with it. And I know it was easier for her during COVID not having to present and not having to show up every day and speak to people in passing. Um, but let me just look at the question so I can refer back to it. Um, just like are we, are we still good you guys looked a little further yep 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 we can hear you <laughs> um just kind of being there and understand that everybody has different comfort levels like i am really talkative i will constantly talk to people i will get in trouble for talking in class um but like for other people that's not them and just accepting that and not forcing like um, calling on people like randomly like that's really anxiety inducing for people um, so just I don't know accepting that not everybody is able to participate and be where everyone else is is just I think the main part of um, helping people who are struggle with uh, social anxieties I, I think that's absolutely true I think the other piece of this is that we have all lost social skills, mm -hmm. all of us. Um, I can't make small talk to save my life. <laughs> I, I was, um, a friend said to me that she was going to some kind of event and I said, and you're gonna talk to people? Like, how are you gonna do that? Um, and in fact, I'm, I'm not even predictable to myself about what I'm willing to do. There are situations where I say, I'm just not, I'm not going to do that. And two days later, I might say I can do that. Um, that my comfort level is a moving target at all times. Um, and my ability to make to do what I could used to be able to do in social situations, in professional situations is diminished. I just can't do what I used to be able to do. Um, and I think it's actually important that we acknowledge that and not make ourselves feel ashamed of it. Um, but simply say, not now, maybe not ever, but absolutely not yet. Um, so I am very aware, for example, that well, in my synagogue, I, my synagogue is a hugging synagogue, um, that there were times when there were times when I walk in and I say, not a hugging day, you know, and I will literally stand like this, don't get close to me. Um, that's, look, fear is a form of wisdom. It is fear is something our brains produce because um, there's danger. And I'm not gonna fight my brain all the time. I'm gonna lose if I do that. Um, so I, if I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Um, I think that one of the things that we can absolutely do with anxiety and social anxiety is to name it and to normalize it. There is, um, there is some research um, by a woman named Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F, -F, who talks about self-compassion as opposed to self-care. 
um, that self-care, she says, is another chore. Oh, I'm going to do self-care. I have to do yoga and I have to and I have to go exercise and I have to eat right. And, and that self-care is a chore and it takes time that I may not have. Um, but self-compassion doesn't take much time at all. What happens in self-compassion is actually three little steps. The first is that I name what I feel. I'm anxious. The second is that I validate what I feel. And so instead of saying, you have no right to be anxious or what the hell is wrong with you that you're anxious, I say, it's reasonable that I'm anxious. I'm anxious, it's reasonable that I'm anxious. And then I'm kind to myself. Um, and one of the things that Neff has found in her research is that one of the most effective and immediate ways of being kind to oneself is to put your hand on your face very gently. That when you put your hand, and my guess is most of you have just done this, <laughs> that when you put your hand on your face very gently, not like this, um, <laughs> that what you end up feeling is comforted. That that's an act of kindness. So three things, name it, acknowledge it, be kind to yourself. And if you practice that and, be, and everything in the mental health field, everything in the wellness field is dependent on practice. Um, Emily knows that better than at the rest of us, that you have to practice and practice and practice. Um, mental wellness is the same as learning to be a concert pianist. It doesn't happen because you because you're in Carnegie Hall. It <laughs> happens because you practice it. Yeah. Um, that if you practice that, you actually will get incredibly good at calming yourself down because that will calm you down. And Maybe. I also think just to add to that, you know, sometimes when you're, sometimes a kid wants to do something and they just don't want to do it alone. Yep. And so sometimes asking them, if you see that um, somebody that you're, you're interacting with is like on the fence, maybe they want to do something, they're feeling at, at anxious about it. Hey, do you want me to go with you? Or do you want to try this together? Because as Betsy was saying, we've forgotten how to do half the things that, that we used to be, or we're scared to do things that we used to be comfortable doing. And sometimes we don't even know that we're scared. Right. And we know that one of the best predictors of, rec of resolving, moving through trauma is a relationship with a trusted adult. That adults can shepherd kids, it doesn't have to be a family member, adults can shepherd kids um, simply by being reliable. Um, that doesn't mean it works with every kid, and there clearly are kids who are suffering like Emily did and need to be put in an environment that is safer than the environment they were in but that should be temporary. That should be temporary. And it should be a skill building place. So, that so you... go ahead, sorry. sorry. Um, Kim has a question and I just wanna preface this by saying that um, Emily is gonna answer this question, but she's gonna answer it from her kind of authentic self and own viewpoint. So just kind of sharing her own um, you know, what she kind of said to me, like, I have a very liberal viewpoint, so I want everybody to know that. Um, but this is part of being, you know, we talk about being your authentic self. So um, Kim had asked, how much does your experience of growing up in a world with increased awareness of climate change, racism, sexism, classism, anti-Semitism, trans queer phobia, et cetera, affect your mental health? And how do you cope with being in the world as it is now? Um, I'm going to try to keep it short because I know we're kind of running out of time just in case there's more questions. But as Rachel said, it's a very, I think it's a very liberal standpoint, but I also know it's just something that a lot of kids feel in general. Um, being made aware of such hard topics, such um, such heavy topics, it, um, we have the feeling that we need to fix it. Um, especially as being the younger generation who's going to come into the world and is going to be the next leaders and the next presidents and the next teachers. Um, these are things that we're learning about now. So then we can bring upon change and awareness later. So like queer phobia, I, um, I'm the president of my school's GSA 
and we were struggling with um, GSA's Gay Straight Alliance, but we were struggling with homophobic slurs being used um, just around campus since we got back from COVID. And as soon as I was made aware of that, I made sure that I that we sent out a message to the school that that's not okay. That is not what we stand for, especially as a younger generation who who's learning. Like we have so much experience from older generations and like mentors and family that like bringing it down, we have um, a deeper understanding of, I think how to treat people just in general, like everyone's accepted, everyone's loved. And so like, I get, I get so, it's so, it's so heavy holding all this and knowing that it's on us to change it and almost being expected to change it like because there is so much hate and so much violence right now it's it's honestly just saddening and it's it's horrific i like i see the news and it's being reposted for awareness and i'm just like oh wow like there's only so much i can do right now but i know that i will and so many people around me are going to make a change so it does not keep happening and i'm so excited that I have that ability and I will be in a place where I can make a change and things get evened out to my perspective, to what I think is the best way that we can live in our future. You know, it's interesting, um, Emily, one of the things that we found and it's anecdotal, not research-based. So, you know, that doesn't, this isn't science. This is what people thought they saw. Um, and, and that's an important distinction. Um, but one of the things that people seem to have seen uh, coming out of summer camps this past summer was a real increase in kids who define themselves as in as non-binary. Whether they're um, whether they're saying they're trans, whether they're saying they're, not as much in the on the gay straight. Um, access but on the non-binary access yes on the trans access yes right and we're really seeing um we believe we are seeing more of that mm -hmm. um i actually um i think that th that this may be a kind of a gift of covid that mm -hmm. because we weren't wearing the costumes of gender didn't have to wear the costumes of gender for so long um, that kids are really looking at their own costumes and saying, what's what's more real for me? Um, and not being as willing to be shoved into a gender binary. Um, what I think is going to be interesting about it as kids return home from camp settings is um, families family and community responses, because my guess is that there were lots of there are lots of people who said all I want is for you to be happy, but meant and not in that way. Um, and so that there is a there's a I think there's really potential for there to be some discomfort in families around um, gender identity uh, um, that feels so much less. Um, loaded for your generation than it does for older generations. Um, and and so I, I wonder if if you're if you're seeing that I'm not talking about you in particular, um, but if you're seeing that in in your peers, if if the um, gender non binary question is one that's that's arising more frequently. I do think there is an increase of um, gender, gender, um, fluid. fluid. Yes, there we go. Exploration. Yes, yep. all, all of it. Um, and I do think it, it's come from COVID and having the space um, to, to explore yourself without, um, without feeling the need to conform. And I think it's like that as well with um, sexuality. Um, when I say gay straight alliance, it's it's the queer straight alliance, the LGBTQ club. That's so we do have everybody, and 
from when I first joined freshman year, there is there is more um, gender non-conforming people, gender fluid people um, who show up to our meetings. And I think it is because people have had the space to explore without feeling judged, even if that is in a home where they do not feel accepted, um, are not accepted, I think that social media has provided a safe place. Even when people say social media isn't great for the developing mind as there's so many, as you use curated um, perspectives that are shown, it also, it also provides a safe place if you're not safe or welcomed in your community. And so there's really pros and cons to social media and I personally cannot argue either either end, even though I think I do have a lean a little bit more to allowing kids to have social media for exploration because I think that's really important to, to teenagers and young adults and society in general. But I think I think there is an increase in fluidity in everything right now. And that's that's so cool. <laughs> Yeah. Do you think that, do you think the increase in fluidity is COVID related or do you think it's simply your generation is um, more open? How would you know? I mean, I'm not asking you to tell me what the truth is. I'm asking you to, what you think, what you think. I think, I think it stems from us, uh, my generation being more open. Um, uh -huh. like a lot of people around me are very aware of their mental health and their mental health struggles. Um, and that's something that I do not see as much in older generations is being open to diagnosis and exploration of mental health. And so like that, you also don't see as many gay questioning, lesbian, um, gender non-conforming people in older generations as you do in my generation. And I think it is part because we're so open, but then also on top of that COVID. So I think hand in hand, they are, they've just opened up like another like realm just to explore and be. And that's, again, as I said, so cool. Yep, it is cool. So I, I want to shift gears a little bit. I, I, I don't think there are questions in the chat that we have to respond to, so, but I want to ask you a question, Rachel. Um, it seems to me that there are at least locations in the country, not everywhere. Um, where there's also real status involved in not feeling psychologically healthy, where in fact, where it's there's some um, sense that of, of specialness, or I'm not quite sure what the right word is, in having a diagnosis. Um, do you th do you see that? Um, and when you see that. Does it feel like those diagnoses are real? Oh, that is such a um, tough question to ask uh, yeah. or answer. I think, <laughs> don't they say that like our favorite answer is mental health professionals? Is It depends. <laughs> or tell me more about it. Tell right. me more about that. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I really think I think you are so right that it is it is a status issue um, in that people become very much attached to a specific or can become very much attached to a specific label and they have to get like the very best treatment or X, Y, and Z for this label versus for whatever it is they're feeling or experiencing. And as a provider, it becomes really difficult because sometimes you're like, but that's not what's actually, like somebody told you this 10 years ago, but that doesn't seem to be what you're talking about right here and right now for you or for your child. Um, and so what we really need to address is what's happening for you in the moment. And I see, I mean, I see this a lot, um, particularly when it comes to um, not only mental health challenge, well, mental health and neurodevelopmental challenges as well, um, just like wanting either the label of autism or the label of bipolar disorder. And a lot of times 
my question to a parent will be, what I want to give you is an understanding or for us together to develop an understanding of what your child is experiencing, not what some label says they are. Because right. so, so what we need to do is help address those, those symptoms. Um, but, you know. You know, one of the really interesting questions that I think exists for all of us around issues of wellness um, and notice I didn't use the word mental health, I, the expression mental health, I use the word wellness, um, is that um, there is this huge crevasse, um, chasm between um, wellness and perfection. Mm -hmm. That in fact, when I am well, and in our research, researchers have told us that wellness is not just about mental health, it's about economic wellness and, and sexual wellness and occupational wellness. There's all sorts of kinds of wellness. Um, but when I'm experiencing wellness, it does not mean I get, I'm getting an A at life. It actually means that I'm more resilient. Um, and that I, and what we mean by resilience is not that I'm getting an A at life, but that I can manage stress better. The, the goal here is not to be stress less. That's called being dead, I think. <laughs> um, and the goal is not to be, um, to, to, be without pain the goal is to be able to to manage who i am in the world at the moment mm -hmm. um and the kind of the stressors of the world so i mean my goal with weather is not to i, I, I don't live in santa monica i don't live in southern california where the weather never changes my goal with weather is to know what shirt i should be wearing <laughs> as opposed to not having to adapt to that. My goal with wellness is to is to figure out how to adapt and respond, um, not to avoid stress, but to adapt and respond to stress. Um, and I, I think you know we and we have one question which I want to get to, but I think Betsy, just to add to what you're saying, I often think of mental health, mental wellness as a continuum. Just like I believe that everything exists in you in these days, right? And so we ebb and flow kind of along that continuum. Um, just like some, and some days we will feel kind of similar to what you were talking about, Emily, when you first started um talking with us, that some days you feel more depressed than others, right? And some days you feel more anxious or more stressed or more. Um, of whatever it is you're experiencing and feeling and that what we really want to give our youth is those skills to learn how to live with and manage those challenges and not try to get rid of them because right. the reality is is that stress is never going to go away completely. Right. So. And, and that a lot of what I have to do it in those moments when I wake up and I'm blue or I wake up and I'm anxious. Um, I think many of us have spent a lot of the last 20 months waking up anxious. Um, and a lot of what I have to do is I have to say, I'm going to survive this. This is going to pass. Um, I want to respond to a, a, a different topic, which has to do with kids lashing out and cursing. And um, look, and one of the mistakes I think we make is that when our kids tell us they hate us, that we that we get caught in that message. Um, in fact, your children are allowed to hate you, um, and th and that's not really. I, I'm gonna, I, this a little tangential. Um, it was very clear to me as a parent, my children are all adults. It was very clear to me when I was actively parenting that my job was to make people that I would like and admire when they were 30, not people that I liked and admired today and not to make them happy. Um, that I always had a long-term vision of 
what am I doing here? And what am I doing here is really to get them out of my house and have them be competent adults. Um, and that that was my obligation to them. Um, so if I had, a, if one of my kids cursed at me, I, I would kind of go like, I don't really care. Um, it, it takes the wind out of somebody's sails if they are attacking you and you say, I, I just don't care. Um, but it would be a real shift if that's something you've never done. Um, I, I used to say to my kids from when they were very little, I'm in the Bad Mommy Hall of Fame. I'm a charter member of the Bad Mommy Hall of Fame. Um, and in fact, part of being a, a good mommy is to piss people off and disappoint them and say no. Um, that does not mean that that kind of behavior of lashing out and cursing at you is tolerable and that's and and for each of us that which is tolerable is um is really important it can sometimes be a moving target but it is really important um that you can't do that with me now if that's happening on a regular basis then the therapist in me says, make sure you get some help because you shouldn't be in a position where you're being terrorized by your children any more than they should be in a position where they're being terrorized by you. That's not okay. Um, an occasional I hate you. Yeah, I, you know, BFD. Um, you're allowed to hate me because I have to say no. Um, and I have to say, you have to do this. Um, but if that's on an ongoing basis, um, we should not live with people who terrorize us. Betsy, would you say that it's similar for teachers that their job is also not for their, to be their students' friends and for their students to kind of love them, that they also should be setting these, you know, similarly to parents? Yeah, I, I mean, look, it, your children, even in COVID, even in after this last almost two years, your children have have the opportunity to make friends who are their peers. Um, it is not it, it is not a parent's job to be a child's friend. It really isn't. Kids don't get that many parents. They have lots of options for friends and they have lots of options for friends in the future. Um, so I I don't think you want to be your kids friends I think that actually disables the very important role that you have, which has to do with. guidance and values and boundaries um, and keeping them safe. Um, and I think there are lots of ways that we can work with our kids to do those things. Um, but I but not not to be terrorized. So um, um, I, I, I just I, I don't think that I don't think that's the way families work. Um, and and th and family therapy does work. It's wonderful. It's actually um, I, I, I no longer do therapy, but I used to love doing family therapy because it's really nice when people kind of get in their lane, which is a lot of what family therapy is about, is helping people remember, oh, I'm actually an adult. Um, yeah, and you had spoken about that, Emily, a little bit, right? Yeah, so I was just gonna, I was gonna provide my perspective as, as, a, as a teenager, young adult who has done this to my parents. Um, I have cursed at them, I have told them that I don't know if I've told them I hate them, but I've definitely put that across that I, I could care less. I like I'm upset with them. And so something that has been, that has impacted me of what they said back to me or done, like done back is my mom and I are tuning forks. If we're both feeling, if she's feeling something, I'm going to be feeling it too. If I'm feeling something, she knows something's up. So when I'm lashing out, she usually she usually feels heightened emotions as well as I do. And so she we make space. We ask for space and be like, okay, we can come back to this later after we can speak like adults. Because with heightened emotions, 
you're almost in like a childlike state. And so removing ourselves also lets me reflect and be like, hey, I don't hate my mom. She does so much for me. I am so grateful for her. And like, just gives you that room to breathe before coming back and then readdressing. So just the ability to space and then reconnect gets rid of those heightened emotions that you most likely do not mean. Emily has a lot of skills, <laughs> a lot of skills. And a lot of those skills have to do with the fact that she's been in therapy and that she's yeah, learned, she's learned techniques, you know, in the same way that you had to, you know, that I had to learn how to drive. Yeah. Emily has learned techniques that ha will serve her well in her future because she does, because she's, because her brain is working even when she's reactive. And, uh, and I think that it behooves us all as we look at you, Emily, to be really aware that, first of all, you have given us an extraordinary gift tonight um, with, with the kind of openness and, and honesty that you've shared with us. But also that this is, um, this is what, grow, what growing up to adolescents look like when they've yeah. got, when they've got wellness skills. Because, and, and, you know, wellness skills are, have to do with naming how you feel, not pretending you don't feel, but naming how you feel and taking a break when you can't manage yourself and understanding that sometimes when I'm impulsive, I'm an idiot. And <laughs> um, that Emily's got skills because she learned them, not because she's human. And practice. And practice, yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, it's not that every kid should have Emily's skills. Emily has skills because she learned them and she practices them. Right. Um, so kind of one final question on, on in the vein of skills, right? Um, a little bit of a different perspective, but as a preschool teacher and teaching children who for most of their lives have been living through a pandemic, are they more likely to be predisposed to anxiety and depression? Um, and what are the best tools to teach them to help them cope? So the answer to that is we don't yet know. <laughs> um, the, we know that kids who grow up in refugee camps are more prone to anxiety and depression. That makes sense. Um, but for many of our kids, you know, I, I have a three-year-old granddaughter. She doesn't know a, life, a world without masks. She's too little now that she's only been masked. Um, the... And this doesn't feel abnormal to them. Um, I think a great deal of, I, I believe that what will predict the, the, how much anxiety and depression these kids are gonna experience really has to do with how much their parents are experiencing right now. Um, that if you grow up in a household where there's heightened anxiety and heightened depression, and there's a sense that we're on the edge of the cliff all the time, I think that that becomes normal for you. Um, so, you know, to, to the degree that we can not be crazy, we will help our kids not be crazy. I mean that in the most clinical fashion. Um, and in terms of tools, the best tools we ever give kids around emotional, not around um, emotional health, are language that 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 I can identify what the feeling is, where it's happening in my body, how I'm experiencing it. Um, language helps us moderate our feelings. Um, we know that if I'm sad and I tell you I'm sad and you respond to it in an appropriate and supportive way, I will feel less sad. And if I'm happy and I tell you I'm happy and you respond to it in an appropriate way and supportive way, I will be more happy. That in fact, um, we can shift our emotional state by naming it and be and finding it acceptable. It's when somebody else, when we name it and somebody doesn't find it acceptable, that does not change, that, that intensifies the bad feelings. But naming bad feelings and having them be accepted actually moderates them. And we are out of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank you both, Emily and Betsy, uh, for your 
um, participation and amazing kind of presentation and, and sharing with us tonight. Um, it's been amazing to learn from you. Um, to everybody, to all the participants, I have posted um, a link in the chat. Um, please, please fill out the feedback form. You'll also get it in an email. But um, what we have found is that if people do it now, they're way more likely to do it. So if you um, wouldn't mind just taking one minute uh, to fill out the survey so that um, we can gather your feedback and uh, let us know what you would like to hear about, learn about in the future. Emily, Rachel, thank you so much. This has been such a... I, Emily, I want to go on a road show with you. Um. <laughs> I, mean, I would love to. Like, thank you for so much for letting me speak and sharing my story. It's just gives me so much, so much joy, so much meaning. Pride. So. Pride. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Someone says, please go on a road show together. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> we should. Maybe we should. Yeah. Our podcast. Okay. All right. Rachel, thank you. Emily, thank, thank you, you. everyone. You all good, good evening and, and go fill out your forms. Thank Bye. you. Bye. You don't want to, you don't want us to stick around. And you're welcome to, if you want for a minute to debrief. Um, I'm, 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 I haven't had dinner. I'm like desperate. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you are well, go eat Betsy. Okay. Ray, Emily, you were fabulous. You were fabulous. You. I, I mean, this was so much fun for me. You were fabulous. It was a lot um, of fun for me too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go have, have dinner. Bye. Bye.